Well, that's a beautiful picture of being a father and what it means. Uh, there's an older white minivan, just a little announcement, uh, that has all the windows closed, and uh, there's a dog in it, and so if you could make sure you open those windows up, uh, that would be great. And so it's getting pretty hot out here, and Pastor Mac, just thank you, mentioned that. Well, good to have you here. I don't know how many fathers do we have here today that have uh, been made a father in the last year, anybody? You have children uh, about a year or so? Uh, stand up. How old is your little one? How has it changed your life? A little bit. A little bit, I bet. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. <clears throat> Nothing like being a father. I'd like all the fathers to stand. We want to thank you for being with us and uh, pray a blessing on you. Uh, we have honored you by uh, giving to Teen Challenge uh, rather than giving you little gifts here today. So uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the perfect father. We love you so very much. But I just pray that you would bless each father here and the potential fathers as well, that, Lord Jesus, we had gleaned from your word today so it helps us to be more what you want us to be in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Let's give the fathers a great hand. <clears throat> Happy Father's Day. Well, today we will be speaking uh, to the fathers, and, of course, uh, all of you will be able to glean things from this, but uh, a word that I believe God has given uh, me for the fathers today. Let's ask God to speak to our heart through this word. Father, thank you for your holy scriptures, and I just pray that today you would guide us through them and encourage us to be the best fathers we can be. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, again, uh, I'd like you to consider, uh, as being a father, there's training involved, and um, uh, the Bible tells us in Proverbs, it's 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Training a child is important in the way. Training by example certainly is the most important way. But what way should he go? Well, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we want to train our children to follow Jesus. Uh, that's the most important thing you can do for your child, more than anything in this world, training them to have a love for Jesus and for people uh, so important. And <clears throat> today, of course, you're going to have fun with your families. It's the first day of summer. Uh, today. That's kind of exciting. I remember telling a guy that years ago I was uh, getting a pair of shoes at Montgomery Wards when it used to be at the mall. And the teller there, uh, he, he looked a little down. I said, hey, it's the first day of summer. Yeah, the days only get shorter now. <laughs> <clears throat> Is the glass half full or half empty, right? And, and so I, I just thought, how negative can you be? But anyway, have fun today. Do some fun things with family. But today, as we look at God's Word, <clears throat> training involves a lot of different things. Training a child. And by example, God wants us to train by example. I believe there's some essential and very important qualities and attributes that fathers uh, need to have to do a good job in that training. And so there's going to be four things I'm going to be talking to you about today that I believe will be helpful to you in these training times. And we're never done training. We're never done training. And so, uh, number one, uh, I believe, uh, again, these qualities fathers need to look at. Love is so critical that a child knows that they're loved. And God tells us a lot about love, and it's not just loving uh, our children, <clears throat> it's loving God with all our heart. Uh, the greatest commandment there is is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor is yourself. And the Bible tells us if we do these things, all the other commandments hang on these. They're all going to fall into place if we're taking care of those two. Love. <clears throat> and so uh, let your children see that in your life. 
Uh, tell them you love them. Practice that love in everyday life. Uh, love your wife. <clears throat> Very important for your children to see you love your wife and for you to tell your wife that you love her and for you to practice that love in your home where your children see how much you love your wife. <clears throat> the Bible tells us, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. That's a sacrificial love, isn't it? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It says, husbands, love your wives and don't treat them harshly. Your children should never see you treat your wife harshly. That should never happen in a home, should it? <clears throat> and so God wants you to exemplify this love that he talks to us about in the Bible and to show that love, to be able to show it to your children, to love your children. It says <clears throat> uh, to, um, in Proverbs thirteen twenty four, those who love their children care enough to discipline them. <clears throat> discipline is part of that process, isn't it? Uh, training telling them uh, what's right and what's wrong and, and helping them to choose those uh, wonderful ways that please the Lord. So uh, the Bible is real clear on these things. Love is so very important for a father. And the, the wonderful thing about our Heavenly Father is we know that he loves us. Do we deserve his love? Do our kids always deserve our love? No. There's times we have a hard time. There's times <clears throat> that I'm sure God looks at, why does he love us? I mean, none of, none of us are worthy of his love, are we? But God loves us so very much. I'm so grateful that while we were yet sinners, Christ gave his life for us because he loves us. So it's sacrificial love in our relationships with our children, parents giving, and we, we continue to give and give and give. First uh, Corinthians 13, we read it a lot in... Marriage and weddings, uh, we talk about this, but 1 Corinthians 13, 4 uh, through 8, it tells us that love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. <clears throat> love. When we love our children that way, it's amazing what happens in their lives through love. And don't just, don't just, uh, you know, sometimes... Fathers have a hard time saying it. I mean, your children may know it, but do you tell them that you love them? Do you tell them that on a regular basis? I think that's important. It's important. Um, how many of you had fathers that had a hard time saying, I love you? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of you. Fathers that have a hard time saying, I love you. And, and that's, that's important for a child to know and not just a child, an adult child, to know that they're loved, isn't it? And so tell them you love them. <clears throat> so important to say that. Uh, my dad, and I've told you this uh, before, but my dad, when he was dying, I was taking care of him. He had cancer. And um, when I was leaving his house, I, I reached over and I said, Dad, I love you. And he had a hard time getting those words out of his mouth. He just had a hard time saying, I love you. And he'd just, he'd say, well, same here, he'd say that. And, and that just didn't cut it for me, uh, the same here deal. Um, and so I said, Dad, did you hear me? I said, I love you. I said, can you say that to me? And he looked me right in my eyes. He says, I love you, son. And that was important. And I got it out of him, you know. It, I got it out of him. And, and so it was a little easier after that for him. But I love you. Kids need to hear that. Children need to hear that they're loved. Adult children need to hear that they're loved. We all need to hear that we're loved. And God tells us that and reaffirms it continually 
And as good parents, as good fathers, we need to do that in our relationship. And they need to see that you love not just your wife, <clears throat> not just your neighbor, but the Bible takes it another step further. Jesus takes it another step further, and he says, love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. That's not an easy task, is it? And your kids are going to be someday bullied. They'll be picked on. They may be made fun of. And you need to teach them that things like that happen in life. They're not good. But God wants us to love those people and pray for them anyway. That's important to learn. And what an example, the uh, tragedy that took place down south in the church where the people were killed and yet those people publicly said we forgive you and we pray that God will forgive you that'd be hard to do but uh, these people that's what God can do in our lives and that's what we have to share with our children that uh, forgiveness is key in loving even our enemies so love <clears throat> is one of the important things you need to cultivate and love is a decision it's a decision. Sometimes, like I said, we're not lovable. Sometimes your kids aren't lovable. Uh, there may be a day that they totally rebel against you, that you go through a hard time, uh, and yet we love them no matter what happens. Love isn't easy. Sometimes it's hard. But I'm glad God doesn't give up on us. And it says love never gives up. And so we have a wonderful Heavenly Father. So love your children. Tell them that you love them on a regular basis. Now, the second thing is we need uh, communication. We need quality communication. It's so important uh, that we have the right communication with our children, that we talk to them the way God would want us to talk to them. How do you communicate with your kids? Uh, it's important. Ephesians 6, 4, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurturing of the Lord. And that's so important that we remember that. And how do we do that then? Well, it's important that our words are picked carefully before we let them out of our mouth. It says the tongue is a little member, but it kindles a great fire. Uh, we saw in that one video <clears throat> a man that was uh, showing his son, took an opportunity to show him how to work on the tractor uh, and, and the farm equipment. And he, he was showing the son and taking that as an opportunity to fix something. I'm not real mechanical. I don't think I could show my son too much. Actually, my truck just died yesterday. Um, I had a guy look at it, and he said, I'm sorry, i got some bad news for you. It's dead. It's, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> well, it's 26 years old. I suppose it's time to go to the truck graveyard, but whatever. Uh, so, but taking opportunities to... to to teach our children how to do things. I remember my brother said, I wish, you know, Dad never showed us how to change the oil. And, and we need to take opportunities to train our children. They'll remember things. Uh, a friend of mine back in, in grade school, his dad told him to go get a wrench. And he came back with the pliers. And his dad got upset and said, don't you know what a, this, you're stupid, you don't know what a wrench is? Crescent wrench? And those words were in his heart. They're in his heart the rest of his life. That was, that was 45 years ago or longer, 50 years ago, and he still remembers that moment where his dad criticized him for not knowing the difference between a wrench and a pliers. Our words can minister life or death, and that's what the Bible tells us. Uh, it's so very important uh, death and life, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can minister death or life to your children by the words you share. And God wants us to minister life and not death. 
So very important for us to pick our words carefully. Proverbs 16, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Proverbs 16. Very important words here. Uh, Verse 21, it says, The wise are known for their understanding, and pleasant words are persuasive. Doesn't have to be harsh words, does it? Pleasant words are persuasive. Just think if that father instead of yelling at his son or demeaning him, would have gone out to the garage and said, hey, Ron, let's, I, I want to show you a few things. You know, maybe I've never showed you in the, a, a garage these different tools that I have, uh, but these, these are the, uh, the different tools I have, and they have different purposes. And so, uh, anyway, this is a crescent wrench. It's adjustable. You can do this. You use it for different things. Um, and if he would have done that, it would have been such an opportunity to teach his son rather than to demean his son. And so all of these things are important. <clears throat> then it goes on, uh, verse, uh, let's see, verse 23 in the same chapter. From a wise man come, comes wise speech. The words of the wise are persuasive. They can give instruction. The words. And then verse 24, it says, Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and healthy for the body. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul. Our kids today, more than ever, need kind words. They need kind words. We need to speak with kindness to our children. We need to speak with kindness to one another, don't we? And our words. One thing, after you speak a word, you can never get it back. Never. That word, you'll never be able to take it back. We need to be careful with our speech. The Bible is clear on that. And we need to have life-giving words, words of encouragement to our children. And it's not just the words we speak to be good at communicating with our children and quality communication. We need to be good listeners. And certainly listening is not just with our ears, but it's looking at that nonverbal communication of a child. Uh, So many young people are struggling with depression. And it's so important that as parents, we see that and we spot that and we can try to help them. And it's, it's not always easy, but we need to look for those things. We need to listen to our children when they talk to us. Uh, we need to have quality <clears throat> communication, listening to their heart, listening to what they're saying, just like our Heavenly Father listens to us. So important. So your communication, your words have to be chosen wisely uh, in parenting. So very important for all of us. And so <clears throat> the third thing is not just uh, the communication, but now it's the time we spend together. Uh, how much time do you spend together as a family? How much quality time do you spend together? How much quantity? What's the quantity? How much quantity time? I mean, do you give your kids five minutes out of the day? You, uh, what time do you spend together? What are your priorities in life? That time we spend together... Uh, and, and, and to have that quality time together and the time that we need together. I was uh, doing my sermon at a restaurant the other day, and I saw a family, uh, four people sitting around a table having breakfast, and all four of them were on their iPhones. All four of them. They were probably talking to each other, texting back and forth. Uh, but they were all on their iPhones and, and I, just, I just couldn't believe it. And, and I, I, I went up to him and I, I said to the mother, you're probably texting him across the table, aren't you? And we laughed together. But, but families today are being, uh, their time is being threatened by all of this junk. Sure, it's good stuff, right? I mean, I like my iPhone. I like my phone. Anyone like your phone? I mean, it's, you know, I don't see how a kid could ever flunk out of school. Just, just ask Siri, right? I mean, it's answers for everything. And, and so, so yeah, they're, they're good, but you know what? They can be bad. And so we have to be careful. When I was growing up, we didn't have all of that stuff. 
We had an RCA, black and white TV. That's what we had. You had to get up and turn the channel. That's what we had. That's, that's all we had. And, and that started distracting us as families, right? And now there's so much out there. There's so many distractions. And so we have to take and we have to use our head and we have to say, let's put our electronic stuff away. Put the phones away. When we're at dinner, we're not going to do that. You know, um, we're not going to, even when I, I remember calling Karen and her mother would answer and, and <clears throat> I, I, could I talk to Karen? No, we're eating supper. And Karen would yell, Mom! But anyway, we're eating supper. Right? Anyone remember that? When you were eating supper, you didn't answer the phone, you didn't talk on the phone, you were with the family, you're together. And so there's times to shut the phones off. We need to learn how to communicate. These are important things. And, and the young people, it's kind of a scary thing in our society. They're pretty good with their dexterity and, and, and texting, but their communication, their verbal communication, it's, it's changing, and we have to be careful with that, and we need to communicate. And we need to have quality time together doing that. We need to spend time together. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I just think it's important. Luke 1, 16 and 17, it talks about how God will change and, and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. God wants us to spend time with our children, quality time. What time do you spend with your family, uh, with your spouse, spending time together? I will never forget John Andreessen, who was a friend of mine. I worked for him in high school and just out of high school. But he uh, tells a story, and I've told this to you, but it's an important story. He was involved in many committees in the city, involved in a lot of different things, very active. Uh, he was in a bowling league. He was in a golf league. In the summer, he had all these different things vying for his time and a young family at home, a young family at home. His wife sat down with him at supper. She said, John, your kids are going to grow up and you're going to miss it all because you're never here to spend time with our family. You're never here. She said, something really needs to change. He quit his bowling league, quit the golf league, got off of some of the committees, and he made a point to be at his home eating supper with his family every evening and spending more time with family. So important, because I want to tell you, it goes by so fast. So fast. You'll see that. Is it Joe? You'll see that. How old is your little one? Five months. In a blink of an eye, it'll be five years, starting school. And then before you know it, it'll be out of high school, planning a graduation party. Isn't that crazy? And then it'll be a wedding. And then you'll be a grandpa like me. Okay? I mean, that's how this thing goes. <clears throat> it, <clears throat> excuse me, it is unbelievable how fast it goes. And then all you have is those memories. We need to spend time together because with that time, we're building with our families. Nothing better than being with our families and loving our families. My grandkids now, they'll let me hug them. They'll, let, they'll sit on my lap. But you know what? In probably five, ten years, no way, Grandpa. You know, I'm, I'm out of here. You know, blow you a kiss and they're gone. And, and it goes too fast. So take that time with your family while you have it. Because before you know it, they'll be gone. <clears throat> and I've read you the cats in the cradle and the lyrics to that. And that whole song with the father and, and the son. And the son wanting to spend time with the father. We'll get together then, son. We'll get together. And pretty soon it's the father wanting to spend time with his son. But son has no time. Busy on his job. Running, doing this and that. And so <clears throat> it's, it's scary. It goes so, so fast. Uh, the final uh, attribute and quality uh, that you need to pray for in your life is humility. And humility is a very important virtue for every Christian. 
everyone that follows Christ. Humility is very important. It doesn't mean you're not confident. It doesn't mean you're not successful. But who do you give the glory for those things? Do you take credit for who you are and what you've done, or do you give God the glory for who you are and what you've done? Humility is very important. Your children will see that. Humility. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, was interesting. He, had, he was, I mean, the most powerful man in the world in his day. And one day he gets up and he looks at this king. Look at what I've done, he said. How I've established this great kingdom. And God taught him a lesson. He gave him a prophetic word ahead of time. But he had to crawl on his hands and knees for seven years. He was like an animal. Uh, God took away his cognitive reasoning. And after seven years, God humbled him. You see, if you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. All right? And pride comes before a fall. That's what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. But then he realized that God was the true God, the only God. And he humbled himself and he gave God all the glory. The great God of this universe. Isn't he wonderful? I mean, here, here again, first day of summer, the sun. Isn't it amazing how it's the most northern part of this hemisphere? It's up here with us. And how it's going to change and go back into the southern hemisphere. Isn't it amazing how it just does that? You know why it does that? It's not because of those supernovas. You know, I can't believe people actually believe that we're here as a result of some, some big bang explosion and that we were then just, we just happened. It just happened to evolve. It takes a lot of faith to believe that. My Bible tells me that God wanted us here, and so he created us. I've wondered about that. I thought, well, God, you've been here forever. Why would you wait so long, you know? We haven't been here that long. <clears throat> but God created, he wanted us here. Who knows what he's going to do in the future? But it says that we will be with him. Did you know God just spoke the world into existence in the heavens? He spread forth the heavens with his hands. That's how the sun is there, and that's why it's there, and, it, and, and it's, it's the perfect distance, because God wanted it that way, and that he formed us and created us in him, his image. I'm so glad we have the answers, and, and people are looking, and they're looking, and they're looking, and yes, science is a great thing, but um, you, you need faith in the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God, our Heavenly Father, wanted us here. And so, again, pride. Uh, another man that fell because of his pride was King Manasseh. And, and he was arrogant. He did not follow in the footsteps of his father. Uh, he, he worshipped other gods. He started doing the wrong things when he became king. <clears throat> and God humbled him. Allowed his enemies to come in. <clears throat> they put a nose ring a large ring through his nose, like some of your kids, <laughs> all right? But they did this for another reason. Then they put a chain in the nose ring. Well, that happens too. But this was a chain that they dragged him with as they brought him into slavery. And when he was in his slavery, when he was in at his lowest low that you can be at, he humbled himself and cried out to God Almighty to forgive him for his rebellion. Humble yourself before God humbles you. Humility. And God lifted him back to his place and restored him because, it says, he humbled himself before God. Humility <clears throat> is very important. And if I asked you the question, are you humble? And you said, yes, you're probably not. And, and so what is this great humility? It comes from God, certainly, and acknowledging him instead of ourselves. Uh, pride always comes before a fall. 
It always comes before a fall. <clears throat> Do you give the glory to God for who you are and what you have? That's an important question to ask yourself to know whether or not uh, you have this humility that God wants you to have. <clears throat> Second question. Do you apologize when you are wrong? Are you ever wrong? Are you ever wrong? Have you ever been by somebody that's always right? Anyone? <clears throat> it's hard to be by them, right? And, and so... Can you apologize when you're wrong? Do, do you admit <clears throat> to your children when you make a mistake? I think it's so very, very important. Very important. Kelsey, did I ever say I was sorry to you? Did I ever teach you to say you're sorry? <clears throat> and we have to do that quite often, unfortunately. When you make mistakes, you need to say you're sorry. There were times maybe I was too loud with my kids. Maybe I made a mistake. Uh, maybe I disciplined out of anger instead of love. I tried not to, but maybe I did. And I had to go to my son or my daughter and ask for forgiveness and tell them I was sorry that I did it wrong. And then we prayed together. And I've always taught them that the best thing is to do it right in the first place, but the second best thing is to admit you're wrong and to ask for forgiveness and try to do it right the next time. It's so important to say you're sorry. Some men have, that's the hardest words to come out of their mouth, is I'm sorry. And so admit when you're wrong, <clears throat> ask for forgiveness. Uh, pride repels, doesn't it? You see these certain athletes that are so... They're hung up on themselves, and, and it just, you, you, you hate to see them win, really. And then you see these athletes that, man, they're just humble. You know, they don't take the glory for themselves. And, uh, man, this thing is a team effort. I couldn't do it without everyone else here. Those are the type of people you like to cheer on. Pride and humility. The Bible talks so much about it. <clears throat> Pride repels, humility attracts. Important words to remember on this is say I'm sorry. Say please and thank you. Signs of humility. Please and thank you. Say forgive me. Tell people you love them. Use kind words and encouraging words. There's so many stories, James 4.10, and it tells us, humble yourself before God and he will lift you up. There's a blessing to come as we do it, but it's a command to humble ourselves and not to be boastful or prideful. <clears throat> Two stories you can read on your own. One is Luke 18, uh, 9 through 14, and it's uh, two people that went to the temple to pray, and one man was looking around at people like in church, well, I'm glad I'm not like them. And that's what he was saying to God. I'm glad I'm not like them. Thank God I'm not like these people. The other man was on his knees at the altar. Just saying, God, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve anything you give me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And Jesus, who told the story, said that it was the person that wouldn't even lift up their head at my altar that left justified, not the man that thought he was righteous. There's a huge difference, isn't there? A huge difference in humility and pride. Matthew 18, I will read this to you quickly before I read you a short story. <clears throat> Matthew 18, verse, starting with verse 1. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? See, even the disciples got hung up on pride and who's the best. 
Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's how much God loves our children, your children. And that's why it's imperative that we take the responsibility of being a parent seriously. That's why that we need to put these beautiful attributes into practice. Love. Telling our kids we love them. Practicing it. Spending that time together. So important to spend that time together, isn't it? doing things together, doing things together, communicating with our children and being willing to humble ourselves before them, before them and leading them right into heaven. They're watching everything you do, every move you make. And moms and dads, it's going to be us that will lead them into heaven by our examples. And that's why we need to Follow these wonderful truths from God's holy word. I'm going to read you this story in closing. It kind of wraps it up. A man wrote this down. It's a father's interpretation of 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> and there's a quote before the story. It says, The only rock I know that stays steady, the only institution I know that works, is the family. <clears throat> From Lee Iacocca. The family. The family. And this is written by John Giovanni. Uh, says, Though I manage a staff of many, but have not managed my family, I have managed nothing. And though I have negotiated the deal of deals while neglecting my children, I have negated the opportunity of a lifetime. In fact, my God-appointed duty is a father. Though I become a head of state but fail to assume my role as head of the household, I am but unemployed. And though I have trained personnel enduring hours, days and years, but have not trained my child in the way he or she should go, I may claim not the title of teacher. Though I consult executives that have not been available to my own children for consultation, I remain the misguided one. Though I prioritize my workday career and do not prioritize my home life, I have prioritized a progressive distancing of those who in fact mean the most to me. Though I earn great wealth and respect among my peers, though business through business accomplishment, yet I fail to earn the respect of my wife and children, I am reduced to a very poor man. Though I travel the world pursuing my goals, yet am not available to drive my son to a ball game or my daughter to a recital, I have indeed boarded the wrong, the wrong plane. Never get that time back, do we? And that though I bestow all my accomplishments to provide for my family, and though I work until utter exhaustion, but do not make time with my family a priority, it profits me nothing. And yes, I must keep in perspective that if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. And if a man won't provide for his family, he is worse than an infidel. Should I choose, however, to tolerate the devastating demands society has placed on family values. God help me. 
for I have failed to recognize that toleration is the first step to deterioration. Time can never be recaptured once it's passed. Time will not even pause for a moment, nor will time be forgiven as it is fleeing away. Time spent together cannot be measured. For those precious moments become priceless memories to the beholder. When I was a child, I thought like a child, cherishing each moment together when I took my daddy's hand. When I became a daddy, I recaptured that moment each time my little girl took her daddy's hand. For now, those memories seem as fresh as today, <clears throat> as fresh as yesterday. And had I known then what I have learned until now, might I have spent just an extra minute at home instead of at the office. And now, abide time management, quality time, quantity time, these three, but the greatest of these is time itself spent with your children. And that's from Chicken Soup for the Soul for Fathers, a nice book, nice Father's Day present. But it went with the message I had for you. And I think it's so important that we take it to heart today, dear friends, that we cherish the moments because they go by so, so fast. That's why we have established a family day with our kids and grandkids every Sunday. They come over, we cook, they mess up, we clean up. We have fun together. We have time together. Don't let it slip by you. I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer with me. As you consider these important words today, there may be things that <clears throat> God would want you to change in your busy schedules or your life. Don't let that slip away if God is speaking to you about certain things, spending more time together. Allow God to make those changes that are necessary. And to be what Jesus wants us to be, we need him resident in our heart. And there may be somebody here that would say, Pastor, I don't even know if I'm a Christian, and you're talking about all these wonderful virtues. Well, to have the love you need for your neighbors, for your family, for your enemies. You need Jesus resident in your heart. And to be a Christian, you need to be willing to invite him into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior, to turn from your sin and to receive him by faith. That's where it all begins. If you haven't done that, but would say today, Pastor, I want to do that. I want to give my life to Christ and follow him and his teachings. I'd just like you to slip up your hand if that's you. Say, that's me, Pastor. I'd like to give my life to Christ. You're not sure about that decision? Would like to talk to us? We'd love to meet with you and help you with that very important decision. If you're watching online, you can call the church or you can go right on the website where it says, Need Jesus. 